is one that has preoccupied me most of my adult life. Both in my capacity as a young officer in the Grand Air Force and head of state for close to two decades. As a young flight lieutenant in the Grand Air Force, during the period of military interventions of the 1970s, I understood that peace could never prevail while corruption and injustice were destroying the fabric of our society. Since that eventful decade, often known as the lost decade in development terms, the world has become more interconnected, more open and more committed to democratic values. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of our quest to build a world of mutual understanding, sustainable peace and prosperity for all, part of our framework for achieving these laudable goals can be found in the UN Sustainable Development Goals 16 and 17, the last two of the SDGs, Goal 16, urges us to promote peace and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Thus, Goal 16 recognizes that without justice and accountability, for all in our society, there can be no peace. As I have always said, there should be no peace when the values that bind us together as a society, worthy of emulation, are corrupted by unworthy leaders. This was the principle that governed our actions in 1979 as well as 1982. But ladies and gentlemen, how do we implement Global Partnership for Sustainable Development if we do not confront the challenges of the current global political climate and the death of international political morality of some of the world's leading nations? How do we engender peace? How do we engender peace and security when some of the very forces that seek to impose their moral compass on us are suffering a serious decline in international political morality. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Moon yesterday was sharing with us a suggestion she made to some Chinese about investing a tiny proportion of their military or security budget into providing initiatives that will bring comfort, especially, into the lives of the underprivileged. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am glad. Unfortunately, some of them are no longer here. I was going to say, I am glad that we have a number of high-powered American citizens with us, and I hope my comments will be taken in good faith. But I can see that Dick Chin is not here with us. The former speaker is also not here with us. Let's make sure they get copies of the speech, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, even though we were colonized by an English-speaking country, my children did not go to China or Russia for their education. None of us, or none of them, speak Chinese or Russian. We all speak English. We think in the English language. We are still allies living and working together. So I don't mean what I'm going to say as a star in their back. But I want, them, I want us to draw attention to what's going on. The United States needs to do some readjustment in order to restore the image of the liberating country that she used to be. The United States will have to find a better way of taking the course of justice or democracy to needy areas. There was a time when America had the image of a liberated country, but her approach of late is undoing that image and making her look like an aggressor. 
if America is trying to undo the socialist or communist economic philosophy, capitalism has replaced communism in Russia and significantly in China. So why is there a persistent antagonistic policy, especially towards those two countries? Ladies and gentlemen, an impression is being created that the United States wants to control the world, and that's not, that's most unfortunate. Mahatma Gandhi once said he was in search for the truth in God when it dawned on him that God actually lay in the truth. Without the sanctity of truth, without the sanctity of freedom, and without the sanctity of justice, the quality of democracy we want to espouse will lose its value. Some years back, when I was in office, and President Zuma was in charge of the military of the intelligence machinery at that time under President Nelson Mandela. He came to Ghana on a visit and I implored him to do everything possible to ensure Mandela's health and security. Mandela had become the conscience of the world. The quality of his truthfulness and candor was very liberating and refreshing and the savagery of capitalism, using Pope John, John Paul's words, would not be too happy with the power and authority of Mandela's truth. Ladies and gentlemen, a few years later, when I left office, and Mandela was also out of office, and had become such a great icon, I called on him and suggested a way to preserve his voice and conscience through other outstanding and noble personalities for the benefit of the world. When he passed on, the United States, the old ally, needs help to see that her degrading image is becoming the image of the unipolar power better on controlling the world. If her economic and moral might cannot do it, there is no reason why she cannot do so by military means. This thrust is not only creating stress and discomfort, but is contributing to insecurity around the world. Meanwhile, some very serious human rights violations are also contributing to the undermining of international political morality. The persecution that the Palestinians have been subjected to all these years does not only affect Israel, but the United States as well. If Israel can ride on America's shoulders and continue provoking other countries like Iran and Syria, why wouldn't Saudi Arabia also enjoy the same negative privilege? The persecution of the Shiites is the misuse and abuse of the relationship with a great power like the United States. The cruelty that the Yemenis have been subjected to would have been characterized as any cleansing if it had been perpetrated by other World War Green parties. Ladies and gentlemen, from the collapse of the Soviet bloc, the world falsely assumed the tensions of the Cold War would give way to a period of genuine peace, global prosperity, collaboration, and a shared vision for humanity. Instead, the post-Cold War period has been defined, has been defined by a never-ending series of global conflicts, many involving the same players who we all had assumed would be leaders of conscience. Their exploitation of the trust, the vulnerability, and indeed decisions across the world is unprecedented, both in their ability to resort to, barbar to uh, barbarity and the 
illegal use of force. The most prominent, of course, the Syrian conflict and the situation in Yemen. Conflicts that, though tragic in themselves, have been significantly worse by outside players who seem more concerned with their interest than in a peaceful resolution. These have not only played out in military terms or in the ever-polarizing media, whose role, it seems, is as much to inform about conflict as it is to fan the flames that ensure said conflicts perpetuate themselves. These conflicts have also played out behind the scenes in the form of clandestine, often barely concealed partnerships of deadly convenience between so-called champions of democracy, sovereignty, rule of law, and some of the most vicious factions and personalities of our time. How can we speak of true democracy when the conditions for peace are entirely dependent on the interests of a single foreign nation or external interest parties that are often, that often directly contradict both the will of a nation's people or indeed that of the wider international community. Ladies and gentlemen, is this what it means to live in a unipolar world? That nations no longer have the rights of their own destiny, choice of leadership, system of government for economic partnership for fear of facing retribution by their Western masters for whom said sovereign decisions are an inconvenience in spite of the interests of otherwise sovereign countries and the wider international community are we all so powerless to speak up. There was a time the United Nations was seen as the single most important habitat between equals. A way for us, as equal people of this planet, to fairly engage and settle our differences. It is with irony that such a governing body, formed as a direct response to the most violent conflict in human history, is, in, is uh, incapable of stopping even the most basic whims and caprices of some of its key members. Now, it seems the UN is a place where vulnerable nations, amongst others, go to beg in vain to an international community. I will just ask a few more pages, please. Thank you very much. This is not meant to be an all gloom and doom. In my time as head of state of Ghana, I've seen great suffering and an equal measure of incredible human kindness and solidarity in the face of extreme difficulties. Even in the darkest of times, there was always a chance for hope, change, and renewal for people. We captured this need for continuous change and development both in words and in deeds by a simple yet fundamental philosophy that is probity and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, after more than a decade spent working with ordinary Ghanaians to notch the country bit by bit with great difficulty and sometimes interference, both foreign and domestic, back from the brink of economic and social collapse. We came to understand a little something about the nature of humanity, big or small, rich or poor, powerful or less powerful, the key to any disparate group rallying together for an honest shared existence is simply probity and accountability, transparency of leadership, accounting for actions and furthers to all. Ladies and gentlemen, are these not the principles that all nations of the world demand and strive for in their dealings with others? Principles laid down with checks and balances? This simple yet fundamental principle, now more than ever, is ripe for rediscovery in the face of these challenging times. Today, as leaders in the international community stand by either mute or offering declarations of condemnation with each successfully more blatant abuse of power by one nation or another, we see the problem escalating and sadly perpetuate itself. Today, we we'll sit by watching as the Yemen situation escalates beyond a human disaster. 
the most appalling human catastrophe in our time. And according to the United Nations statistics, let me say to you that, it's simply horrible. Ladies and gentlemen, we have become dehumanized to the ongoing proxy war, waste in the Congo, in Syria, at the expense of millions of people that have already died there. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sad to know that hundreds have been killed in Cameroon, in West Africa and Central Africa, all because they seek parity in their basic livelihood. Interestingly, France, the United States, and the UK, and their allies seem oblivious to the horrendous situation in that country. Ladies and gentlemen, I would have wished I could finish this. You know? Take a look at this one. I read close to Lauren Babel. A true patriot by every stretch of imagination was yanked out of his country and delivered to the ISIS by friends and its allies. After eight good years, the court finds no credible evidence against him and discharges him. Bizarrely, the ICC prosecutor, who clearly is operating on the dictates of the embarrassed powers that be, decides to shamelessly appeal and once again curtail Babo's freedom. How can you punish him to another country on some twisted bail terms that effectively makes him prisoner and prevents his freedom of international trouble? Trouble, including going back to his own country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm done. However, what I want to say is that, etc., 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 these developments on the environment, on the environment, I didn't get the chance to talk about the environment, are intrinsically linked, linked to the immoral political theatrics exhibited on the global stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I think. Thank you. Next speaker, I invite uh, 